again. My name is Keith Mosier. I'm one of the teachers at the Memphis School of Preaching and have been there for 42 years. We're studying Isaiah in this series, and we come today to Isaiah 48, verse 12, and we have here an extensive study now of the history of that period, which is, was designed by God to give Him glory. If you look at verses, 48, uh, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 48, you will note that God told Judah that He had refined them, and then verse 12, for His glory. And He will not sh share that glory with another. It was for His sake, verse 11, that He did all of this, and for the sake of humanity. Humanity is blessed because God chose Judah, and through Judah He brought the Messiah to the world. And that history was supposed to be to God's great praise. But unfortunately, Judah went after idols. God has to put her into captivity in order for Him to use her again when she comes back from captivity to bring the Messiah. So what you have here from chapter 48, verse 12 and forward are the facts of that period that have to do with God's intention to bring Messiah. Here in chapter 48 and the rest of it, from verses 12 through 22, what might have been in Judah could not be. And so God says it could have been since I'm omnipresent, verse 12. I'm omnipotent, verse 13. It could have been that you would not have had to go into captivity. So everybody should come and listen to what I'm saying, God said, verse 14. All ye in Judah, assemble yourselves together and hear what I'm telling you. But they did not listen, of course. The Lord hath loved him, Judah, but God has to do his pleasure in Babylon. And eventually he will punish them for being so wicked. So it shouldn't surprise Judah that God is punishing her when God will punish any nation that's wicked. And I believe that that history obtains today. There's an application here. Well, who said all of this, that God was in control of history? According to verse 15 of chapter 48, God did, and here's the reason. God said, I spoke, yea, I called him, Christ, I brought him, and he will make his way prosperous. I have a purpose in all of this, to bring the Master, the Lord, the second person of the Godhead, for your salvation. So come near and listen to this, verse 16. I've not held this back. You've always known this. Notice very carefully, friends, that God has not spoken in secret from the beginning. God always had a plan in history. It was to His glory that He did this. And then He says at the end of verse 16, now, the purpose was to send me. Messiah is coming. And God says so. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. That's the way it is in history, verse 17. I am. I taught you to, for, my, for to be profitable. I taught you and led you and told you the way you should go. Of course, they didn't go that way. And so what might have been has changed. They're going into captivity for a purpose so that they can be the right kind of people through whom God will bring his Messiah. He said, also you would have prospered in other ways had you done it right, verse 19. But you're now going to Babylon. You're going to uh, run and hide. And, and then when you go to Babylon, when you're in captivity and you come out, you'll begin to understand why I did this. That's the end of verse 20. Probably a very important idea that they will learn that the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. They thirsted, not when he led them through the desert. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He, he had blessed them, so what might have been will not be, because there's no peace. Listen carefully. There's no peace for the wicked. Not even God's people will have peace. When they're wicked. Well, what is this all about, my servant? 
Now we have the second of the servant songs or psalms, praising the coming Messiah. This is verses 1 through 13 of chapter 49, a servant song. We had another one in chapter 42. This is the second. In verses 1 through 4, we're told that God will empower Messiah. So everybody in the world should hear this message, verse 1. Listen a while. World, come around and listen. I have a purpose. I'm bringing the Messiah, and I will empower him. Well, how is he going to do it? The Messiah will be called from his mother's womb. That's an allusion to the virgin birth with Mary. And so we have the idea that he would be born as a human being. He will come that way into the world. He will have a message, sharp message, the Word of God, Hebrews 4, 12, verse 2. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. God will protect him. He's a polished shaft. He's a quiver. He is a sharp teacher. He's coming with the power of the Word of God. And it's a word that pierces like an arrow. Hebrews 4, 12 again. Who is this? Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Judah, I'm, I'm bringing him through you. Hebrews 7, 14, folks. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah. God says so here. And it's interesting that when you read the whole gospel according to John, you read about how he came and that this is God in the flesh. This is the Messiah. But the Messiah, when he comes, will be rejected. Verse 4, and he will, this is a statement that's rather hyperbolic because he says here that the Messiah said, I labored in vain. I came and nobody listened for the most part. John 17, 1. Yet surely my justice is with the Lord. We know who he is, but he came unto his own. And his own received him not. John 1, 11 and 12. And my work with God, he finished the work his father sent him to do. John 17, 1 again. And so we have in the first four verses of Isaiah 49, the fact that God sent this Messiah. God empowered this Messiah. And the Messiah is expressing a sort of disappointment in the work that he did in the sense that nobody was listening for the most part. Now in verse 8 of this text, we'll be told that God heard this statement from Messiah. Thus saith the Lord. Well, I had a purpose in it. I'm proving that this Messiah will come in the acceptable time, the day of salvation. And so this is not going to happen in Isaiah's day. This is a time when the acceptable year of the Lord starts, the age of Christianity. And the one who's coming is empowered by God. What's his mission? Verses 5 through 7 of Isaiah 49 as we praise the Messiah coming, as we think about this servant song, we'll learn here what his mission is. Listen to it. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. He comes in the power of God, and God says, this is a light thing, that thou shouldest be my servant to the Jews, the tribes of Jacob. That's a light thing. That, that's understood. But the thing that's heavier to understand is the fact that he's also coming to be a light to the Gentiles. That's a fact uh, that he came for the whole world, John 3:16. But the Jews, of course, rejected that idea when he did come according to Romans chapters 9 and 10. In fact, Paul was so upset that the Jews had rejected the gospel, he said he would be rather a curse from God if that would help any. Of course, it could not. But the Messiah came as a light to all people. It was a light thing to understand he came for the Jews, but that he came for all things. He tasted death for every man. Hebrews writer tells us, chapter 2, verse 9, that this Holy One of Israel, this Messiah, has a mission to the whole world. And so God said, I heard you. Your trip's not in vain from heaven to here. 
And so in the day of salvation, I help thee. I will preserve thee, Messiah, and give thee for a covenant of the people. He will have a purpose. He will come to the Jew who will be able to come back to God through Christ. And all of that is his mission. In verses 9 through 13, we have his work stated in this servant song. That thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth, prisoners of sin. This is repeated by Matthew 4, 17. John says he came as a light to the world, so this one came to them that are in darkness. They shall feed in the ways. The new Israel, the new church of Christ will be a high place, a preserved place, a place of peace. This is his work to start his church. This place is a place of peace. Verse 10. It's interesting to think in the world in which you and I now live, as I speak these words, this country in which we live is very troubled. We, are, we have a country in darkness in reality, almost like Judah was. But there is a place of peace. And when we assemble together as Christians, we should remember this is the only place of peace. The only place where I can go where I'm not afraid of the world. And so I love it that Isaiah said in the long ago, Remember, we're down around 701 B.C. that this place that Messiah would build, this church, will be a place of smoothness, verse 11. And it will be a worldwide thing. Wherever we go that Christians gather, verse 12. Either the north or the west or even from Sinim, that may be China. All over the world, he says, there will be a place of peace. It's exciting to read Isaiah here and to think about what our Messiah did for us. Then he says we should sing about that and praise God that all of this history to His glory was to bring Messiah to the world. Now in verse 14 of Isaiah 49, or 50, 49, excuse me, but Zion said, now, a sad statement. Well, the Lord rejected us to bring this to pass. No, He did not reject Zion. God says, can a woman forget her baby? He said, you may forget Judah, but I have never forgotten Judah. Oh, if the Jews could understand that. God did not reject the Jews. He brought Messiah for them and the world. They didn't like the idea in that time that the world was ready for salvation and covenant. Why? He's our God. He's, it's our covenant. And they made it a middle wall of partition between them and the Gentile. Their enmity toward the Gentile took the law of Moses, which was designed to teach all people, and made it a partition wall that I took that away so I could make one new man out of the Jew and the Gentile. I want all the people of the world in one church. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. But Zion said, No, God, you forsook us. It's a rather selfish thought, is it not, that God only belongs to the Jews? God said, And I did not. I didn't forget you. In fact, He said, I wrote your name on the palm of my hand. He knows who the Jews are, verse 16. Israel was a constant reminder to him that he had made a promise to Abram, and through them he would bring the Messiah. A peaceful place is coming. and That's my purpose, verse 17. So Judah, got your head up and look around. And all these events in history are coming together for a purpose. Through you, Judah, and come to thee, as I live, saith the Lord, 
Thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all. You're going to go through this process. You're going into captivity. It's all going to happen for that purpose. Uh, and you'll wear that thought, Judah. Bind it around you like a bride does her wedding garment. You're going to live through that thought. Because you're going to be a land of destruction. Verse 19 but it's too narrow. The covenant with the Jews was too narrow. It didn't include the whole world. But when the Messiah comes, the whole world will be included in that covenant. And those people who took you into captivity will be far away in your memory. They will not exist in the way you think anymore. This widowed kingdom needs to be a wider kingdom. It's needed. The children which thou shalt have, that's a reference to going out and getting the whole world into one people in the church of Christ. After that thou hast lost the other, when that covenant is done away, they will say in your ears, your place is too difficult for me. Judaism needs to understand. It's not the place now that God designed for all the people. It's too narrow. It's too difficult to do that in one covenant the way it was. We needed a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, we need a wider kingdom to include the whole world. Then, Judah, you'll understand when you come back from captivity, verse 21, who did all of this? God, who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children and am desolate. Well, if our covenant ends, what is it? that we have out here, new children, yes, the whole world. And who are these people, you'll be asking, the Jews will. Uh, oh, I was left alone. No, not anymore. And where were these Gentiles? You know, they weren't following you. They should have done by long-standing practice the things that God taught, but they didn't. Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Romans 2, 10 through 12. Well, God says, who are they? Gentiles, verse 22. Brothers and sisters and friends, the whole book of Romans is written to show that the gospel was for all men. The patriarchal system, Romans 1, 18 through 32, did not produce Messiah. The Jewish system, chapter 2, and, cha and chapter through chapter 3, verse 9, did not produce Messiah. But God did through the gospel. That's a message for all people. That is a message for kings and queens and anyone who is in the world. Doesn't matter how high or how low, there's a new kingdom coming. And in this new kingdom, the members of it, the Christians who are in the Church of Christ, are God's new royal T. 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9. And God asks a question to Judah. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, verse 24, or the lawful captive delivered? God says, Judah, can I, can I actually do this? Can I, can I take you from captivity and do this? Yes. Even the captives of the mighty, in this case Babylon, shall be taken away. Yes, I can do it, God says. And I will do it and take care of the enemies, verse 26. They will eat themselves. What they sowed, they will reap. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. They'll, they'll eat up themselves. When a nation fails, it fails in, in, inside of itself. It eats itself to death with sin and wickedness. And that's what happened to, in this case, Babylon. And God said, I am the Savior and the Redeemer. I can do this, and when I do it, it will glorify me. When we look back on history... The, the southern kingdom did actually in history go into Babylonian captivity. We know that. Those are facts. Those are facts uncovered by archaeology and other 
So we look at history itself and writings we have from the ancient times. And we look at all of that history and God did it. That's the proof. It happened. And He said it would happen before it happened. That's the proof that God is going through all of this. He's doing all of this. God sent the Messiah. God wanted the Messiah to start His church. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. And that church, when heaven sees it, when those powers and principalities look down on the church, the powers and principalities in heaven are angels. When they look down on the church, they see the manifold wisdom of God. This is His purpose. He's going to have the whole world in one. That's what He wants. I plead with all who claim to profess a love for Christ, study your Bible, and notice that God wants one church, one group. Years ago, I was privileged to go to Australia as a missionary. We used to take our Bibles and set them on the table in restaurants because we knew that in this country, evolution and atheism were rampant. People would walk over oftentimes and look at this Bible sitting on the table there, and they would touch it, and they'd say, is that a Bible? Yes. They said, do you believe in God? Oh, yes, we're, we're in the Church of Christ. We are Christians. And one said to me one day, well, I don't believe in Christianity. I said, why is that? He said, because it's so divided. Oh, it hit me right between the eyes. My plea is for one church. That's what the Bible says. But look at all of the division in Christianity, so-called. And this man said, you're all divided. And I reminded that the Lord prayed that we'd all be one. But the only way to be that is through the apostolic teaching. John 17, 20 and 21. My friend, if your congregation where you go is not following the Bible, you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place if you're worshiping with an instrument. You're in the wrong place if you're worshiping in the Bible uh, account on the Lord's Supper. is not practiced every first day of the week, and so on. You're in the wrong place. You're not in the church that the Messiah came. All through history, God worked this out, so it would happen. And I wonder sometimes how disappointed God is in not having that one body that was designed and His Son to be over it, which He is, the one body, Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. What's that body? The Church of Christ. There is no other church mentioned in the New Testament. So I beg you, study your Bible. Look at this history in the, all of the ancient prophets. They're all pointing toward the Church of Christ. It's what He's doing here. I'm going to bring Messiah. Who is He? He's a prepared Servant, for chapter 50, verse 1. And Judah, I'm not divorcing you to do this. I sat in a class in a graduate school, and the professor went to Jeremiah 5, verse 1, where Jeremiah talks about God bringing back Judah from captivity. And this professor said, well, that proves since the teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage was that you couldn't take back your bride, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, once you put her away. Then when God took back Judah, that proved that His mercy, God's mercy, was over, superseded God's law. Well, if I took that position, that God's mercy superseded God's law, I would be able to teach anything I wanted. I'd just say, well, you stay in your adulterous situation because God is so merciful. I raised my hand in that seminar and I said, Sir, could we read Isaiah 50 verse 1? I know Moses taught that once you divorced your wife, you couldn't take her back. But God never divorced Judah. Oh, He divorced Israel. and She had to come back individually. He didn't bring that whole nation back. But he didn't divorce Judah. He said, I didn't give you a bill of divorcement like your sister, Israel. And so where is it? Doesn't exist. God took her back because she was estranged from him, not divorced. He sent her into captivity for a purpose, but not to put her away. In fact, she left 
in a sense, when she sinned. And so Hosea, however, described Israel <laughs> as a prostitute. So she was taken, and as a nation, was never returned. Israel had been put away, Amos 9, 8. And so he said, when I looked at Judah, here's why I did this. Because when I came for my glory to bring my Messiah, I couldn't find anybody there who was right with me. Isn't that a strange statement about Judah? I couldn't find a man. Nobody to defend Judah. And so God said, is my hand shortened? Verse 2 of chapter 50. Look, I could dry up the sea by just saying dry. There's no water. The fish die and stink. I could do that. So you think I can't do this even though I can't find a man in Judah who's right? <laughs> of course he can. He said, I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth. Or cover. I could make the whole heaven black. I'm able to do that. I have that power. And so Messiah says, and I also have that power. Here Messiah speaks. Look, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. And I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He Come unto me, all ye that labor. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. He wakeneth my ear. He gave me birth in a human sense to do this. Messiah's coming. God said, I can do this. I can send you into captivity. I could dry up the sea if I wanted. Of course I can do it. And the Messiah says, the God of heaven opened mine ear. He brought me into a human existence. When the Jews would talk about a baby being born, they say his ears are opened. This is a reference to the birth of Messiah. And he didn't turn away back. He kept coming. He did his, he did his work even though he was scourged. Can you imagine this prophecy in verse 6, 700 years before it happened, that the Messiah will have to give his back to the smiters? He also tells us here something the gospel accounts did not mention. They pulled hairs out of the Lord's beard. My cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. And they spit on him. We know they did that. According to Matthew's account, of the crucifixion, Matthew 27, verse 26. I get stunned when I read these kinds of prophecies. So detailed of what the Messiah would have to come through. And Isaiah is telling Judah, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves, the way you've acted, the way you've been in history for over a thousand years. Look at you people, idolatrous, wicked, practicing all kinds of evil things. And you're all about for God's glory. You've brought nothing but shame. But I'm still going to use you in Messiah's coming, and I know he will be mistreated by you. Remember, Isaiah's talking to the Jews here, and he's saying they will be mis that Messiah will be mistreated by you. Here's what you'll do. But the Messiah says, God will help me. I won't be confused about it. This is Luke 9, 51. And so Messiah says, I've set my face like a flint. I'm going to do exactly what the second, first person of the Godhead sends me to do. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. These are all legal terms here now, brothers and sisters and friends. God is near me, the Messiah says. Who can argue with me legally? No one. Let us stand together. He pleads with the people. Be with me. The Jews rejected him for the most part. People marvel that on the day of Pentecost when the Church of Christ started, 3,000 people were baptized, and they marvel at that number. But estimates are that there were 200,000 in the audience. What about the other 197,000? If I were preaching to 200,000 people, I would expect there would be a large number of baptisms, hopefully. But 3,000 out of 200,000 is few. It's few. They rejected him. 
Well, if you can argue legally about that, if you think that Judaism still exists, give me the legal proof from the Word of God, because it doesn't exist anymore. And so the Messiah says, if you don't think I'm the one and my purpose is to bring the Jew and the Gentile together, give me a legal argument as to why that can't happen. But we don't have a legal argument. We don't have an argument from the Bible, because the Bible teaches us there's just one church today, one covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. God is behind all this. And the old arguments are going to go away. Who is he that will condemn me? They don't have a legal reason to condemn the Christ. They took him to the cross because of envy, not legal reason. He did nothing illegal. They put to death an innocent man. The second person of the Godhead was in that body. There isn't anything legal that folks can do anything about that. Who is among you, Judah? And let's ask the world that too, that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of His servant. These folks who take it upon themselves to be anarchists are an abomination to God. That walketh in darkness, they don't have any light. Well, what they should do is trust in the name of the Lord. Well, they don't do it. Judah is a great example of what happens to nations who practice wickedness. It hurts me to know the wicked stuff that's going on in the United States of America. I remember when I, from the time I was a boy of being so proud to live in a country that was so bent on justice and freedom. What happened to us? Wickedness evil, sin, and actually we don't have a legal argument with God. When we go to the judgment day, what are we going to say? Well, I decided. I did it my way, was the song. That's an evil thought, when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. That's an evil nation that thinks like that. And Judah was as evil as any nation could be, and she was supposed to be God's child. And so he says to all people, listen to God now. This is a message really to Judah initially, but it's a message to all people. Behold all ye that kindle a fire. That is, you try to walk in your own light. Compass about with sparks. Walk in the light in the fire of your fire and in the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have of me, God says. You'll lie down in sorrow. Go ahead and do what you're doing. Your end is sorrow. And he continues these thoughts now, chapter 51. Jerusalem in exile is his point here. Judah, here's what it's going to be like in exile. Before you even go, almost 100, year, 100 years before they went. Here, as I said, here's what it's going to be like. Listen to me. Ye that follow after righteousness. I know there's a few of you in Judah that try to be righteous. Well, you listen. You're going to. You just look unto God because that's the only place where you'll be saved. When you're over there in captivity and you're in that pit of slavery, which you digged, Friends, even Christians suffer when countries become wicked, especially Christians. When God punishes a country, everybody suffers. And so we have to have some comfort for the righteous. When you go into captivity too, just look to Him who put you in that pit. You keep trusting Him over there too. Look unto Abraham your father. Father unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone. The remnant says, well, there's so few of us. The Church of Christ says, there's so few of us. Take a look at Abraham. Abram over there in the Ur of the Chaldees. I called that one person. All alone. But he did what I told him to do, and I blessed him. 
and increased him. You, but God can still use us. I often wonder what it was like for those 11 apostles of Christ who were standing on the Mount Olivet side of Mount Olivet, and the Lord said to them, you go into all the world. Just 11 of us? What would it be like, my friend, if an elder asked you to teach a class in Sunday school time? And he took you down a hallway to an empty classroom. And he said to you, here's your class. Teach it. Well, there aren't any, there's no one in here. There aren't any, any students. Well, go get them. That's how Christians should think. Wherever they go, whatever they're doing, go get them. They will never hear the gospel unless we tell it to them. Go get them. When you're over there in captivity, you remember Abram was all alone when I called him. Sarah was barren when I gave her a child. And she bore you. Out of your, her womb came the nation of Israel eventually. The Lord is your Lord, and He will comfort you, Zion. You remnant are over in our captivity. I'll make it like Eden for you if you'll trust in me. And when you come home, you'll be thank singing songs of thanksgiving and melody. We have been in captivity, most of us, for about three months here in America. Quarantined, locked down, sheltered at home. Last Sunday, we were able, my wife and I, to go to the assembly. Oh, what a great moment. It's like Eden again. <laughs> to be able to leave the house and go. And the remnant will one day be able to leave captivity. And when we came in last Sunday, we sang thong songs of thanksgiving. We were glad when the Lord said unto us, Come on into my house. We came with joy. Well, I can imagine the remnant there in Judah when Isaiah preaches this, when they get a chance to hear this message. We're going into captivity too? Yes, but while you're there, you trust God, and when you come home or your descendants do, they will be singing songs of joy. They will then understand what this was all about. So listen to me, my people. Give ear unto me, my nation. That's for emphasis, parallelism. For a law shall proceed from me. My purpose is a new covenant. This is why the captivity, and we've heard this many times from Isaiah, but here he's speaking specifically to the faithful remnant, and I will make my, make my judgment to rest, my justice, for a light of the people. I'm going to bring in the world. This is the purpose. Sing a song of joy. And look up to the heavens, you remnant that are faithful. You, you look to God now, and He will get you through this. And what I am doing is put, doing away with the old covenant and bringing in the new one, one which will be forever. Verse 6. So you listen to me, righteous, in whose heart is my law. Verse 7. Fear ye not this captivity, the reproach of men. Don't be afraid. God's going to watch. And so, my friend, if you're in a struggle today, a captivity of sin, I know how to get out of that. You repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you're in the Christ and you're still troubled, I know how I can get out of that also and how you can too. Don't be afraid of what's going on around you. Look to God. 2 Peter 4, 4. The remnant of, our, of the enemies, the, uh, the remnant of the Jews who were righteous and will not be needing to fear their enemies, God will take care of them too. Verse 8. So, the prophet Isaiah hears all this. He's writing by inspiration. I wonder sometimes if he put down his quill pen using maybe the last of his lamp black ink and he said, this is so hard to tell 
righteous people. It was hard enough to tell the wicked in Judah they were going into captivity. Uh, how do I explain that to the righteous? Well, he says to Isaiah, God does, wake up, Isaiah. I want you to think about the old times and I, how I cut Rahab. That is, how I cut the wounded one who was hurting my people, and how I wounded the crocodile, the King James has dragon. I want you to remember, Isaiah, my power. I can act the way I did at the Red Sea. So you think, Isaiah, I'm the one who divided the Red Sea. Now you think about that. I'm the one. Now I know it's hard for you, prophet, to tell your people what's going to happen. But I want you to think more about me. Take your fearful thoughts and your sad thoughts and your disgusted thoughts and just push them aside and put me right in the center, Isaiah. Good advice for all of us. When we are troubled in mind, when we are troubled because of our surroundings or the environment, when all of that comes crashing in on us, don't focus on that. Focus on God. And remember, Isaiah the prophet, that those who are my redeemers will come back from captivity with singing. So don't be afraid to tell them what's going to happen because it's going to benefit them. And eventually it will benefit the whole world. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. I, even I, am he that comforteth you, Isaiah. So Isaiah, why are you afraid? Oh, what I learned about the prophet here. His pathos, how he felt when he had to write these things that were so hard, and how preachers feel. And I've known this feeling where I had to go and preach to a people and tell them, you're lost. Oh, that hurts. That's bad. That, that's not fun. That's not joyful. But the end of it is, if I'm telling someone he's in the captivity of sin and here's how to get out, maybe he's upset at the moment. But the end, if he obeys the gospel, is so wonderful. The principle remains the same. Judah, there's an end to this. There's a purpose in all this. And Isaiah, look to me because I can comfort you. God were not with me, I couldn't do it. If I did not have the thought that all of this is for a purpose, I couldn't do it. Isaiah's pathos here inspires me never to quit preaching. Oh, it's hard. People get upset when you preach to them. But don't be afraid, Isaiah, men. Why? Men die. God's there forever. Don't line up with men. Don't... Don't, don't get your eyes on what other people are doing. Look to God. I've known people who quit the church because they said there are hypocrites in it. Where did you expect the hypocrites to be? At the saloon? Of course there are hypocrites sitting there. Don't look at them. Look to God. How hypocritical it is to quit God because of hypocrites. So what? other kinds of evil probably sitting in that assembly. But we don't quit God. So Isaiah, don't you be afraid of men. They are all going to die. But God is there. And so I'm the one that will comfort you. Don't forget the Lord thy maker. The one who created it all. Don't forget him, Isaiah. And that will get you through this problem. God will end the exile. Verse 14. The captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed. God's going to end this. It will only last 70 years. To God, that's not even a day. <laughs> well, it might be. But a day with God can be a thousand years, Peter tells us. In 2 Peter 3. Now, Isaiah, I'm the one that divided the Red Sea so they could go across. 
and the waves roared. I often imagine that scene with all those waves on either side of the people as they walked across on dry ground. And I'm the one that created it also. Isaiah, you look to me. I'm the one that put my words, Isaiah, in your mouth. Inspiration. Isaiah, I gave you this message. Don't you be afraid of it, ashamed of it, or disappointed in it, and don't be afraid to preach it, because I put my words in your mouth. And so I know it hurts sometimes to tell the folks this message, but they're my words, Isaiah, not yours. I wonder sometimes if we blame the messenger for the message. Do you blame the preacher when he tells you something that you need to change and it's hard for you and you say, well, that preacher told me, but he didn't tell me in love. You ever said anything like that? Don't be afraid, preacher, because those aren't your words. They're God's words. And you keep telling Judah, you're my people, but I've got to punish you for your sins. Because there's no one else that can do this, Isaiah. Verses 17 and 18. There's nobody else that can tell Judah you're going to drink the last drop of this problem you caused, verse 17. There's nobody else that can lead them, Isaiah. You're it, verse 18. And I know that two things have happened to you, Isaiah, verse 19. But who shall be sorry for thee? I know there is destruction and famine, By whom shall I comfort thee? You want me to tell you that they're all right and that would comfort you? I can't do that. You want me to tell you not to preach this? I can't do that. These are my words, Isaiah. There's no other comforter. So Isaiah, all through this prophesying time, and it lasted almost 80 years. Oh, excuse me. It lasted almost 50 years. I knew I had to stop there and think what I was saying. It lasted almost 50 years. He, Isaiah had to preach this message over and over and over again. And I know you can see your people dead in the street, caught in a net, receiving the full fury of the Lord as they go into captivity. I know you can see that in your mind's eye, Isaiah, but you keep telling them, Hear this, Judah! You don't stop that message, Judah, uh, Isaiah. You tell Judah, you're drunken, but not with wine. You're a country staggering all over the place in sin. You look like a bunch of drunks to God. Thus saith the Lord thy God, and that pleadeth the cause of His people. Only I can return you from captivity. Isaiah, don't forget that. And Isaiah, you tell them, I'll punish Babylon eventually. Verse 23. But wow. How do you tell a people, a whole nation, it's over for you, and not feel the way Isaiah felt? How can you do that? How can you preach a funeral for somebody not in Christ? It hurts. You have to do it. How can you tell someone living in adultery, you can't stay with her, you can't stay with him? It hurts. How do you do that? You must never be afraid of men. They're going to die. You must understand this is God's message. And Isaiah was as troubled as I am sometimes when I have to preach hard things. On June 26 of 2020, I will have the privilege of picking up my phone at 9 o'clock Friday night and talking to anyone in the whole nation of America that's connected to that app at that moment. I will get a chance to tell them about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And this national campaign started about a month ago and it's going to continue, I hope for a long time, so that at least people can hear there's a way to get out of this captivity. 
it hurts me to drive down the street anymore and just see all these people. So many speeding now. Not, uh, there aren't enough policemen out patrolling, so people are speeding all over the place. Some going 90 and 100 miles an hour now on our streets in this area. It's dangerous. And I think none of those people know the Lord. It hurts. I go into the grocery store, they don't know the Lord. I go to any other place, they don't know the Lord. So Isaiah, he felt the same way. And so he, he keeps his message going, and he tells the people, God said we're coming home one day. And so in this prophecy now, Isaiah speaks to the whole nation and says, get ready, you're going home from captivity. <laughs> I don't know if at this point Isaiah was really convinced about that or God said to say it anyway. I hope Isaiah was convinced that this was going to happen. But this prophecy in verse 1 of chapter 52 says, in essence, to Jerusalem, looking way down to 536 B.C., Time to get up and get dressed, Jerusalem. You're going home. And you're going to be free from the pagan captivity in which you find yourself. Put on holiness, Jerusalem. You're going home. I could think about that in terms of heaven. Put on your garments there, the righteous garments, friend, because you're going home. Get up out of the dust of captivity. You're going home, verse 2. We're free at last. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing. You went into all this idolatry for no reason. You sold yourself to other gods. You put yourself in a position of captivity. And What did it benefit you? So, in order for you to be free, it will have to be without money because you don't have any. And since Judah didn't have any money, the only way she could come home is when God allowed it. And Cyrus supported the effort of the Jews who did come back in 536 B.C. and after that also. He said, you folks were down in Egypt one time. That's when Joseph was there, of course. And we were, you remember that the Assyrian oppressed you. He said, your history has been nothing but trouble. This time is a time of freedom from captivity. And so, what have I here in this captivity that Isaiah has been prophesying that will cause the captives to howl? And every day they'll curse God for being in captivity. Look at the end of verse 5 there. Isn't that something? Therefore, here's the lesson I want them to learn. Therefore, my people, shall know my name. Isaiah chapter 48. All of this history is designed to give God glory. What could have been didn't happen. They followed idolatry. But what uh, will, will be, will be regardless of their wickedness. God's going to bring them home. And Isaiah says, this message is it's hurting me. They, you preach it, they're my words. And when they come home from captivity, they'll know. Because they'll remember that I told them before it happened that it would happen. They'll know my name. And they'll know in that day, when they come home from captivity, that I was the one that spoke, it is I. They will have their evidence from their history. God means what He says. Now Isaiah, I know this message is troubling you, but get awake in your thinking. Awake. Understand how beautiful upon the mountains, how beautiful are those who preach to all people, how beautiful are the feet of Him that brings good news. Isaiah, you really have good news. Yes, you're going into captivity, but you're coming home. Yes, you're in sin, but there's a way out. 
What a great message. It's a message of peace. It brings peace between God and Judah, finally. That message did. And the message of the gospel today brings peace between man and God. As Seth unto Zion, God is king. Isaiah, your feet are beautiful <coughs> because you are sending the message that I want you to send. They're coming home. And those who watch for that return will lift up the voice, verse 8, and sing together. They'll praise God for coming home. And they will understand. They will see eye to eye. They'll understand why they went into captivity. When the Lord brings again Zion, in my mind's eye, I can see 50,000 people coming home. I don't know how they got over to Palestine from Mesopotamia on camel or on foot, but they were full of joy. The closer they got to Palestine, were going home, and they were singing. In about three weeks or four, I will be 81 years old, and I'm close to going home, and I'm singing. I'm breaking forth into joy. I'm singing together. You people who are troubled in captivity, you waste places of Jerusalem, I'm speaking to your heart, Jerusalem. I will redeem you. The Lord hath made bare His holy arm. He, God rolled up His sleeve. He got ready to go to work in history. And He's going to bring them home in the eyes of all the world. Did the Jews return from Babylonian captivity? Absolutely. If I were to ask one of them, why do you believe in God? We got out of captivity, did we not? If I asked a Jew who lived over there in Egypt as a slave, why do you believe in God? Didn't we get out of Egypt? In history, didn't they get out of Egypt? In history, didn't they come out of captivity? My brothers and sisters, Isaiah says, sing about that. And think, we're going home. So Isaiah just says, go home, verse 11. Go out from there. Go home from captivity. Don't come back with the idolatrous ideas you had. Don't touch that. That's evil. When you come home, be clean. You know, in heaven, there's no spot, no blemish. When we go home, we're clean, free from everything. These people would be free from captivity and hopefully free from sin. What a great message of comfort. And yet it troubled Isaiah to preach it. Friend, don't stay in sin. Go home. Come out of there and go into Christ. Roll.